We're here to talk about the future. We're here to talk about your ideas. But before we do, I want to take you about a hundred years into the past to the story of a doctor named Alexander Fleming. Now, Dr. Fleming is on the front lines of the war. He's treating soldiers, and he realizes something. Many of the soldiers that he is treating are dying, but they're not dying from their wounds. They're dying from infection. And so when Dr. Fleming leaves the war, he vows to find a cure to this problem. And in the 1920s, he does. He discovers a mold that's growing that stops the spread of bacteria. Well, Dr. Fleming is so excited about this discovery. He wants to take it out to the world, but in order to do that, he needs resources. He needs lab space. He needs people. He needs money. And the best place to find those resources was the Medical Research Club of London. This was a group of scientists and investors and thought leaders. If you had an idea, these were the people who could make it happen. There was only one problem. Dr. Fleming was a brilliant scientist but he was not a brilliant communicator. And when it came time to present his findings, he stumbled through his openings, he stuttered through his conclusion. Needless to say that Dr. Fleming did not get the funding that he needed that night. But instead of trying again, he went and put his discovery on a shelf and he walked away. Well, over the next 10 years, things got really bad for infection. Hundreds of thousands of people dying until another physician by the name of Dr. Flory comes along and says, enough is enough. We need to find a cure to this problem. So he starts pouring through all of the research that he can find when he comes across an article written by Dr. Fleming 10 years earlier. And Dr. Fleming had even given his discovery a name. He called it penicillin. Well, Dr. Flory springs to action. He calls up Dr. Fleming. He says, look, I think you have the answer. And the two of them partner together. They rally the pharmaceutical companies, they get investors, they partner with retailers, and eventually they make penicillin into something that you could find at the local pharmacy. To date, penicillin has saved nearly 200 million lives, and yet it was something that never existed. South by Southwest, it is such a privilege and an honor to be here with you today. You really are creating our future. And as we know, Creativity and persuasion are two different things. They're two different skills. But oftentimes we treat them as one. You can have a great idea. You can have a great product. You can be a great candidate and still be dismissed. And that's all what got me interested in backable people. Backable people. These are people who seem to have this almost mysterious it quality to them. When they walk into a room, they walk into an audition, a pitch, a meeting, they seem to have this it quality about them. We want to take a chance on them. We want to rally around them. And I spent the past few years trying to figure out, what is that it quality? I studied hundreds of backable people from Oscar-winning producers to celebrity chefs to iconic founders to understand what's their method and can, can it be learned? And what I realized is that being backable isn't just for celebrities. It's not just for CEOs. It's for any of us. We can all learn how to become backable. Because when it comes to our ideas, we can't do it alone. We need other people to rally around us. And so what I learned are a few qualities, just a few simple qualities that I think any of us can put into practice. And today, I would love to share three of those qualities and three specific techniques for each quality as well. So some specific techniques that you can put into practice immediately. So let's talk about quality number one, which is to flip outsiders into insiders. Flip outsiders to insiders. What do we mean by that? Well, in the 1940s, Betty Crocker released instant cake mix to the market. And they were so excited about this new product because all you had to do was pour water into a mix, put it in a pan, pop it in the oven, and voila, you had this tasty treat. And so they were really surprised when instant cake mix did not sell. Sales were terrible. And they wanted to understand why. 
So they hired a psychologist by the name of Ernest Dykta to go into the field and start talking to homemakers. And what Dykta found was fascinating. They had made the process of making a cake too easy, too simple. They had all but removed the customer from the creative process. So Dykta's recommendation was to do one thing, remove one ingredient, just one ingredient from the mix, and see what happens. And so they did. They removed the egg, and sales took off. Because now people felt like they were part of the creative process. Researchers have come around to call that the IKEA effect. And the IKEA effect tells us that we value something that we build up to five times more than something that we simply buy off the shelf. What does this have anything to do with creativity? Well, we've been told that creativity is a two-step formula. You get a great idea and great execution. But there is a hidden step in between. This is where we rally early customers, early partners, early people around our ideas. And in order to do that, we need to make those people feel like they're building the idea itself. We need to make them feel like they are insiders, not outsiders. So how do we do that? Well, here are some specific techniques, some specific things that I've learned along the way. Number one is that when you walk into a room, share what it could be, not how it has to be. Share what your idea could be, but not exactly how it has to be. There was a designer who worked at companies like Microsoft and, and Google as they were becoming really, really big companies. And he was trying to rally sort of these people in the room around his, his creative vision. And he was having a tough time. His idea was for a video chat product, but this was maybe 15 years ago. And so video chat and video conferencing was still relatively in its early days. And so he would walk into these meetings with these designs and they were high fidelity, you know, pixel perfect designs. And he was not having any luck. But then one day he's running to a meeting and he accidentally leave, left his designs behind. And so now instead of putting these designs up on a projector, he walks up to a whiteboard and he begins to draw his vision out. So obviously very low fidelity versions of what he has in mind. But what he notices is that the room lights up. They get up out of their seats. They come to the whiteboard with him. They start participating in the creative process. That ended up being the most successful meeting that he had. And he did it with drawings on a whiteboard, not high fidelity designs. Why? because he was able to share what it could be and not how it has to be. The folks at Intel used to have a saying, which is to fall in love with the problem, not fall in love with the solution. Fall in love with the problem, not the solution. So share what it could be, not how it has to be. Another technique is to make sure that you're telling the story of us, the story of us. Now, oftentimes when we walk into a room, we want to tell the story of me, the story of my idea, the story of my candidacy. One of the people that I, I, I studied for the book is the head of the MacArthur, MacArthur Foundation, which runs the Genius Grant. It's given grants to people like Lin-Manuel Miranda of Hamilton. And one of the things that he told me is that if you're a candidate, if you're somebody they're considering for the grant, and you're already on a clear path to success, that might actually make you a weaker candidate for the grant. Why? Well, because what he says is that if you are already on a clear path to success, then you don't need us. What we want to do as a foundation is we want to influence success. We want to have an impact on success. So we don't want to make success that's already inevitable more inevitable. We want to be able to change the trajectory and have an impact. And I think that speaks to us as humans. We, we want to know that we made a difference. We want to know that we, we made an impact. That is true for backers as well. So what you want to do when you walk into a room is talk about how the story of me and the story of you creates the story of us. How do we partner together to make this vision a reality? The third thing is to make sure that when you're going into a room, you're not staying in presentation mode for too long. You want to flip from presentation mode into huddle mode. Huddle mode. What is that? Well, 
one of the people I spoke to for this book was somebody who coaches executives and, and CEOs. And one of the things she says is when, when you're about to walk into a room to give a presentation or a pitch, the spotlight is, is on you. But your job is to take that spotlight and switch it off of yourself and onto your message and onto your product. The reason we do that is because when we do that, we switch from presentation mode into huddle mode, where we're both looking at something together. And the easiest way to do that is to show something visual. Pull out the app, show the app on your phone, show a visual, show a customer testimonial, show somebody speaking, so that so you are huddled around the same idea. We are so much more powerful, we are so much more compelling when we're showing something rather than simply just describing it. So switch into huddle mode. So that was quality number one, to flip outsiders into insiders. Let's talk about quality number two, which is to convince yourself first. Convince yourself first. So imagine you're in a hallway where, where, where before COVID and way down the line after COVID, and you're in a hallway and you're talking to your colleagues and all of a sudden an idea strikes you and you, you say, hey, guys, hang on one second. I, I got to share something with you. And you share that idea immediately. You blurt it out. And then you look for their reactions. And they kind of give you sort of a, sort of a, huh, that's interesting kind of reaction. I'm sure that's happened to you. I think it's happened to all of us. But here's the thing. When, when that kind of thing happens, when we don't get the excitement in return that we have inside of us, it can be deflating. We, we looked at the way that innovation works inside companies and found that most great ideas, worthwhile ideas, don't get killed inside the conference rooms. They get killed inside hallways. They get killed around water coolers. Because what we do is we share the idea before it's actually ready to be shared. You know, one of the things that I, I, I thought about when I, was, when I was trying to figure out this book was, like, what is it that actually makes someone convincing? What are the qualities of, of a convincing person? And I assumed that I was going to find that they had a certain communication style to them, certain hand gestures, a way of making eye contact, maybe, maybe pacing. But I found that to not be the case. You had certain backable people, of course, that were extroverted and gregarious, but you had others that were, that were shy and, and quiet and introverted. As it turns out, it's not hand gestures. It's not, it's not eye contact. It's not pacing. And, and if you want proof of that, go look up the number one TED Talk of all time, the top TED Talk today. And you'll find a talk by a guy named Sir Ken Robinson. It has over 60 million views, and, and, and Ken Robinson is talking about education, and it's a brilliant, brilliant talk. But it's also very un-TED-like. He's got a hand in his pocket. He's got a bit of a slouch. He kind of meanders in and out of his script. But you believe every word that he is saying because backable people take the time to convince themselves first before they convince others. And then they let that conviction shine through whatever style it is that feels most natural to them. It's not charisma that makes a person convincing. It's conviction. So how do you convince yourself first? What are the steps? What are the specific techniques that you can take? Well, one of the first ones is that when you're back in that moment, in that hallway, and you're having that casual conversation and inspiration strikes, give yourself that brief pause, that brief moment, and think to yourself, is this an idea that I have high conviction in? And if the answer to that is yes, then by all means, share it in that moment. But if the answer to it is no, then consider taking what I call incubation time. Take some incubation time. So don't share it in that moment. Resist that temptation. And then take some quiet time to yourself to really incubate the idea. So what do you do during this incubation time? Well, you know, one of the one of the simplest things you can do is to just actually start to write out your idea. And I prefer to do this in sentences and paragraphs, not to take it straight to a slide deck, because what you're really trying to do is you're trying to get into the logic of the idea. And when we're just writing out bullets, we can sometimes lose the logic, the reasons why we actually think something is smart or why we might actually be doing something. But when you're writing it out in full paragraphs, 
and false sentences, it really forces you to think about like why? Why is this why is this something you're excited about? Why is this something that actually makes sense? And the thing that I would say for incubation time is to make sure also that you're you're willing to throw away work. A lot of these sentences, a lot of these paragraphs aren't going to make much sense. But oftentimes what we do is we wait until we have it fully formed in our heads before we put it down on paper. Reverse that. Put it down on paper first and then see if it actually makes sense. You know, back in the day when I was in law school, Salman Rushdie was passing through town and he's one of my favorite authors. And I really wanted to ask him about his writing style. I wanted to ask him, like, how, how do you become an author? Because, I, you know, someday in the future, I wanted to write a book. And so I begged him. I, I wrote him several emails asking him if he'd be willing to, to spend just a few minutes with me. And finally, he was like, OK, I'm going to be at this location. If you show up for a few minutes you know, before my meeting starts, we can chat. And so I, I walked to this walk to this venue and, 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 uh, and I get there and I'm so excited. And I remember the first question I asked him was it was just a complete and total sort of flat moment. I, I could tell I immediately annoyed him. And the question that I asked was, how do you get inspired to write? He looks at me and he, he sort of kind of just, I mean, he was, very, he was very generous, but he kind of rolls his eyes a little bit. And he's like, look, I don't get inspired to write. I just write. I sit down at my desk every morning and I write. And I write for hours. And most of what I write is not usable. Most of it ends up in the trash bin. But within that pile of trash are these, are these little pearls, these little gems. And I string those gems together to make sentences and paragraphs and chapters and eventually books. And so don't be afraid to throw away work. I want to move to the third quality, the third quality, which is to play exhibition matches. Play exhibition matches. What do we mean by that? Well, I assumed, again, that people who are backable were, were naturals. They were naturally gifted speakers. They were naturally compelling inside a room. But what I realized is that most of them, the vast majority of them, were the product of lots and lots of practice. In fact, they practiced so much that they actually came off as natural. Now, exhibition matches are low stakes practice sessions before you get into a high stakes situation. So low stakes practice sessions. And these low stakes practice sessions can be very, very sloppy. And in most cases they are. But the mantra that most backable people tend to take during these exhibition matches is that long-term success comes from short-term embarrassment. Long-term success comes from short-term embarrassment. So don't be afraid to embarrass yourself, but you can embarrass yourself in front of friendlies, in front of trusted people. And that's the thing about backable people is they tend to surround themselves with the circle of people that they don't mind being embarrassed in front of. In fact, there are four types of people that I tend to find in every backable circle. Four types of people. And the first is your collaborator. Your collaborator. So this is somebody who is constantly kind of building on top of your ideas. If, when you're with them, you almost feel like you're in, a, you're in a musical jam session together. That's your collaborator. The second is your coach. Your coach. And these are four C's, by the way. So your collaborator and your coach. And your coach is a little bit different than your collaborator because while your collaborator is focused on, does this idea make sense for the market? Your coach is thinking about, does this idea make sense for you? Is this something that you would want to do? Is this something that you have a lot of emotional bandwidth associated with so that you can really push it forward and be on the other side of doubt and rejection and still keep pushing the idea forward? Your coach. Your third is your cheerleader. And, you know, your cheerleader is pretty self-explanatory. It can be a little bit cheesy, but we, we all kind of need this person in our lives. Somebody who's going to build us up in that final moment. W one of the people I talked to for the book was a woman named Ellen Levy. Silicon Valley, he, Fast Company magazine named her Silicon Valley's most connected woman. And, you know, sure, Rolodex has members of Congress and Fortune 500 CEOs, but the person that she calls before she walks into the room is her mom. That's her cheerleader. The fourth C, I think, can be the most important, and that's your critic. Your critic, but I like to call this person your cheddar. Because you see, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you right now from right outside of Detroit, and if you've ever watched the movie Eight Mile, 
Eminem is surrounded by a group of friends throughout the movie. But one of the friends is sort of always kind of poking holes in his ideas. And that friend's name is Cheddar. And Cheddar, we all have a Cheddar in our lives. And Cheddar can be kind of annoying sometimes. But it's Cheddar who has our best interest at heart and is still going to be able to point out the blind spots in our ideas. And we need that person. We need that person because we want to get to those blind spots and have answers for them before we walk into the room with a backer. So your collaborator, your coach, your cheerleader, and yeah, your cheddar. Those are your four C's. I want to wrap up by uh, just saying that yeah, it is such a, it's such a thrill to be here because we're, we're thinking about the future. And I have a couple of kids, uh, an eight-year-old and a, and a four-year-old. And, you know, my eight-year-old and I, every morning before she starts school, I ask her two questions. I ask her, what is the meaning of life? And she says, to find your gift. And I say, well, what is the purpose of life? And she says, to give it away. Being backable is how we share our gift. It's how we give our gift away. Because we know that we can't do it alone. We need people, we need partners, we need investors, we need hiring managers, we need even friends and family to take a chance on us. But what I have found is that there are three words, three words that tend to hold us back from sharing our gift with the world. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready to speak my mind. I'm not ready to run with that idea. I'm not ready to step into that leadership role. But here's the thing. After studying hundreds of backable people, what I realized is that none of them were ready. Three friends from design school were not ready to start Airbnb. A mid-level talent manager wasn't ready to start SoulCycle. A 15-year-old from Stockholm, Sweden, wasn't ready to build an environmental movement. And yet today, Greta Thunberg is Time Magazine's youngest person of the year. There were setbacks, there were failures, there were rejections, but they all played what I call the game of now. Not the game of someday, the game of now. And in the game of now, the opposite of success isn't failure. It's boredom. So let's work on the ideas that make us come alive. And let's rally and inspire good people to join us along the way. Because you are ready. Thank you so much. 